So this is where things get cool, and I'm excited about it, and I'm not going to hide it. All right, let's look at that electron and proton again. I have an electron here, and I have a proton here. All right, what do we know about them? Well, we know that they're opposite charges, so they're going to be attracted to each other. This positive charge is going to feel an attraction towards the negative charge, and this negative charge is going to feel an attraction towards the positive charge, right? But that attraction must be a force, right? These are going to start moving towards each other, and if they start moving, that's an acceleration. And if there's an acceleration, we know there must be a force. So it begs the question, how big is that force? Can we actually calculate it? And that's why I'm excited, because I think it's really cool that in physics, if you think about it and look closely, you can kind of figure out what that force should be and how you would actually assign a number to it. Because once we can actually assign a number for the strength of that force, there's so many other things that we can solve. All right, so this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to start with an F, and I'm going to ask myself, what should that force between these two particles depend on? All right, before we do that, we should ask ourselves, what do we actually know about these particles? Well, one thing we know is that they both have a charge. So we'll say that this one has a charge Q1, and this one has a charge Q2, okay? We also know they have a mass. This one, we'll say, has a mass M1, and this one has a mass M2. And what else do we know? Well, we know that they have some distance apart, okay? And when you're talking about electrostatics, we usually call the distance between particles R. And I know that might be a little bit confusing because we're used to calling distance D, right? But in electrostatics, it means R. It's not the radius of the particles, so don't think that. You can get that out of your head right now. R is just the distance between the two particles, okay? So let's go ahead and build an equation here. Well, if I were thinking about this clearly, I would probably say that force is proportional to both the charges, right? The bigger this charge is, the stronger the force. The bigger that charge is, the stronger the force. So that means if F is proportional to Q1 and Q2, then you should have a Q1 times a Q2 over here in this equation, okay? Secondly, I'm going to guess that the farther these particles are apart, the weaker the force is. So in other words, force in the distance R should have an inverse relationship. So what would that look like? Well, we would put an R in the bottom. And it turns out that scientists have looked at that relationship many, many times, and they realize that it's not just R, but it's an R squared, right? In other words, um, it, there's an inverse squared relationship between force and the distance between the two particles. Awesome. It would look as though we have an equation for force. Um, the electric force shouldn't depend on M1 and M2 because that's gravity, right? Gravity depends on the masses, so we shouldn't add in M1 and M2, right? There's one thing missing, though, and that one thing is a constant that makes this have the units of newtons. Remember, we want newtons, right? So in order for this to have the units of newtons, we put some constant K out in front, Okay, there's a couple of different names for it, Coulomb's constant, um, the electric constant, but we're going to call it just K, right? And K has a value, really easy to remember, you ready for this? 9 times 10 to the 9, all right? Okay, so one thing to consider, sometimes in the textbook, and we'll see this a few times, sometimes you see K written as this crazy thing, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. So this constant epsilon naught is called um, the uh, permittivity or the dielectric constant of a vacuum. Okay, uh, So we're not going to worry too much about it. I will tell you right now that this value here for this, this epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. We'll talk about this fellow more later, but in the meantime, this is the important constant to make this equation work for units, okay? Um, so, where are we right now? We know now that if we want to find the force between any two charged particles, any three charged particles, any four, as many charged particles as we want, we just use this equation, k, q1, q2 over r squared, where r is the distance between the particles, and k is this Coulomb's constant, which is 9 times 10 to the 9, this here 
is called Coulomb's Law, which is the law of attraction between charged particles. Pretty basic, pretty simple, okay? Um, so, obviously, I'm not going to leave you there. We're going to explore this and we're going to do some problems. So, if you guys could go to the next slide, uh, it says misconception question number three. Um, this question says Q1 equals negative 0.1 microcoulombs and it's located at the origin. So, whenever they start talking about this stuff, you know, just draw a picture because pictures are the best, right? They make everything way easier. If they say something's at the origin, actually put it at the origin. So, we have something called Q1 over here at the origin. And then it says we have this Q2, which is, and this is minus, by the way, it's a negative charged particle um, uh, of 0.1 microcoulombs. Uh, and so there's an, another particle that's Q2, which is located at x equals 1. So this is Q2, there's 1 meter between them, and this, this is positive. So the question is asking, which of the following is true of the force of Q1 due to Q2? So in other words, what force does Q1 experience as a result of Q2 being there? Before you even look at the answer choices, look as, much, as deeply as possible at the question and tell us what you do know. What do you know here? Well, I know that because this is positive, there is going to be a force on Q1 in this direction, right? There's going to be a force of attraction. So I'm going to put a, say that my little force looks like that. And so let's see here. It is attractive and directed in the positive X direction. Is that what we're seeing? That's what we're seeing. This is attractive, right? This Q1 is being attracted to Q2, and it's moving the positive x direction. We know that must be the answer. We don't even really have to look any further. But I do encourage you to tell yourself why B, C, and D don't work. In the meantime, we'll move on to the next one. Um, another problem to kind of see how this works, and this is canceling Coulomb's force. Okay, um, we're going to do a lot of a, a lot of examples, but in this one. We have two charged particles, and I'll draw it here, and I'll leave the formula up because that's helpful. Okay, uh, we have two charged particles, this one over here and this one over here, and we have one little, little, little tiny test charge somewhere in between. Okay, and it says that here at the origin, this is a 10 Coulomb charge. Um, once again. Coulomb is really, really big, but I just made it whole numbers so that it's easy to deal with. Um, and this is a 20 Coulomb charge located at 10 meters. Okay. Um, where would you have to put a 1 Coulomb charge in order for there to be no net charge? Okay. So the question is, where would this have to be located, in other words, so that the force over here, we'll call this force 2 due to this guy, is equal to this force over here due to that particle. Okay, how would we solve that? So we, we want to get balanced forces here. What are balanced forces again? Well, remember, that means just some of the forces must equal 0, right? Which means F2 minus F1 must equal 0. This is why you learned what you learned last semester. It applies to every different situation in physics where you have a force. That's cool, right? Um, this means that F2 must equal F1. Okay? That's what balanced forces mean. You can start here if you want. You don't necessarily have to do this because you know that if it's trying to be balanced, these forces must equal each other. Okay, but what is F2 and F1, right? Well, we're going to say that this is Q1. We're going to say that this is Q2. And I'm just going to call this Q over here. All right. So F2 is the force of attraction between Q and Q2. So what is that? That's going to be K, Q, Q2 over, um, whew, what is that distance? Well, we don't know. We know that the whole distance is 10, right? And I'm going to go ahead and say that this, this distance here is X. Right? We, we don't know what it is exactly. That's really what we're trying to find, right? The distance that this has to be from the origin in order for there to be balanced forces. So I'm going to call that x, which means that that is x, and this over here would be just 10 minus x. 
right? So in other words, the distance between these two particles is simply going to be 10 minus x, and there's a squared there, right? I just, this is Coulomb's law for these two particles. But that has to equal F1, the force between these two particles. Well, what is that? That's just going to be x, q again, this time times q1, right? The charge of this particle. All over, what is that distance? x squared, most fabulous. What do I see here? I see a lot of canceling opportunities. You know that that makes me happy. That goes away, that goes away, that goes away, that goes away. And if I cross multiply, I get q1 x squared equals, right, q, sorry, q2 x squared, q2 times x squared, right, that's cross multiplying. Boom, right, and then I cross multiply these ones, and I get q1 times 10 minus x squared. All right, no big surprise if you just foil this, you expand this, okay, you get a quadratic, okay, and once you solve for your quadratic, the answer that I get for my quadratic is, you ready? You ready for this? I get 30x squared plus 200x minus 1,000. Okay. This is a quadratic equation. There's a couple of ways you could solve that. All right. One way, probably the easiest way to solve it, is just to go online and find quadratic equation solver, pl plug in your A, your B, and your C, and you get an answer. Um, the other way you can do it is the manual way, the long way, which I encourage. All right. And that way is use the quadratic formula, which is x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And for those of you who have a hard time remembering this, I have a great mnemonic, and that mnemonic is, mnemonic means it's a little device to help you remember something. There was once a very negative boy who was uncertain about whether he wanted to go to the totally radical party. The square boy lost out on four awesome chicks and the party was over at 2 a.m. So, a little helpful thing. Help me remember it. Maybe it'll help you. If not, just write it down. Right, you can look it up anywhere. Um, when I put these into this equation, I get an x value of 3.33 meters. Now it's quadratic, so you'll get two values. One of them's gonna be negative, you could toss that away. You know it has to be between these two particles in order for it to cancel out. So the, the answer that's positive is the correct one, and that's 3.33. So what does that mean? It means that in order for this positive particle to be perfectly canceled out, right, the force on this particle to be canceled out by both of these particles, this particle must be located at 3.33 meters away from the origin. You put it there, it cancels out. We have solved our first Coulomb's force problem. I think I'm kind of sweaty. See you in the next video.